Good morning, everyone. (laughs) Welcome to Hazelwood Christian Church in Muncie, Indiana. We are glad to have you with us this morning. I would like to mention that we have our communal post-it display of things that we have wanted to cultivate and things we've wanted to let go this Lenten season. I know many of us have things that during Lent we focus on giving up something to show Christ the meaning of what he, he did for us. And so we have a, a little poster display on display there of things that we have just written, jotted notes down, things that we would like to 
let go of in our lives. And what's even better is what things can we cultivate in our lives to make our lives richer and more full for you. So that is available out there in the narthex. The post-its are right there for you as well. I want to remind you that we are still accepting donations for Winnie's kids. As you remember, Winnie travels every summer. I think she said she was leaving May 30th. And we have supported her ministry for many years. That's something I'm very proud of that our church does. And she said the cost of uniforms have gone up quite a bit. So she's in desperate need of more money this year. So please consider contributing to that cause. Uh, Monday Thursday service is April 14th at 6.30 in the sanctuary. That will be our service with communion and hand washing. And I'd like to thank Becky Burkhart today. She stepped in and is filling in for Lori. So we appreciate that, Becky, so much. Now I hope you will enjoy as our handbells open our prelude. While Laura comes and, and gets set, um, Ron Mallory is the composer of this piece called Contrast. He is a science arts educator as well as a composer. And um, he wrote these program notes. While most of the music I write tends to be upbeat and in major keys, once in a while, you need a little oscuro to contrast with your chiaro. Those are musical terms. This piece, light and darkness, is what those mean. This piece is meant to be reflective of the more somber moments in life, which helps us to better appreciate the joyful times. Contrast.
Thank you so much, Ringers. And um, you may recognize those faces that they contribute to our music program in other ways as well as bells. So uh, we really appreciate the dedication and it brings such a lovely element to our worship service. And now I invite you all to join me in the responsive call to worship. We have come to worship. May the spirit cultivate in us hearts that are open, ears that hear, eyes that see, minds that believe, so that we may draw closer to the heart of God. May the Spirit help us to let go of distractions and fears, worries and self-absorption, so that we may draw closer to the heart of God. We have come to worship the God of all seasons and the God of all of our days. For God is our source of love, our foundation, and our new beginnings. Let us worship holy and magnificent God. And now I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy, gracious God, whose love is beyond our comprehension, we come today to worship you and to confess that devotion to you is often far from our minds. This morning, may we refocus our attention upon our love for you and how we show that love. Help us to be more willing to pour out our lives as fragrant offerings of love. As we come to you in prayer, we think of those people in our lives who have loved us with a generous love, and we thank you for them, and we ask you to bless them. We especially ask for those who are poor in the basic needs of daily living, and for those who are poor in love. Here, too, the prayers we ask for those who need healing, or hope in their lives, and those who need justice. We pray also for mercy for those fleeing oppression and violence around the world, and who are in need of a home and safety. As we pause for a moment of silent prayer, we wait upon you now, listening for your voice in our hearts. O oh, merciful one, hear our prayers. And as we go into this week, help us to have a focus, a purpose that is beyond that of just simply getting by. Reveal to us our personal ministry and help us to do it. Grant to us a fullness of faith, firmness of hope, and generosity of love. For the sake of the gospel, may we hold loosely to our wealth and daily embrace you in the poor of the world. Cultivate in us a trust in you so that we may give ourselves in the service of others. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We are gathered here today to, wor to worship the God worthy of every song that we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise that we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. I invite you to stand if you'd like and join us in singing, Build My Life. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. 
my life. It's time for our young disciples to join me up front or to come a little closer to your screen on whatever you're watching on home. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. You can tell it's allergy season. Oh, hey, it's young disciples time. Come on, kiddo. Hi. Have you ever heard of essential 
oils. Okay, I figured you would. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to tell you what they are. Essential oils come from plants and contains the essence of the fragrance of the plant from which it is extracted. The fragrance is how the plant smells. Have you ever smelled plants? No? Well, you should try that sometime. Essential oils are used in perfumes and soaps and air fresheners, as well as incense. And essential oils have also been used for their healing properties. There's going to be a picture up here soon. In today's scripture, Mary of Bethany has some nard that she uses to show her love for Jesus. Now, you may be, what is nard? Nard is another name for spike nard, which is an essential oil from a flowering plant. So on the screen, you can see pictures of different varieties of spike nard from different parts of the world. Spike nard is an essential oil that has been used for centuries. Do you know how long a century is? You probably do. A hundred years. For centuries as a perfume, a medicine, and in religious ceremonies. And in ancient Rome, it was even used to flavor wine. I don't have any nard for you to smell this morning. But another flowering plant that is very closely related to spike nard is lavender. And I do have some water spritzer here that has lavender in it. I don't have an actual essential oil for you to smell, but this will be close enough. Oh, yep. <laughs> Didn't need quite that many there. Okay, I'm going to let you take a smell. You don't have to get super close. It's strong. It's strong. Isn't that nice? No, not your, not, your, not your cup of tea. It's kind of good. Yeah, I kind of like it. <laughs> well, it only takes a little bit, obviously, to smell its fragrance. I should have paid attention to my own script. <laughs> Essential oils are expensive, so they usually come in small bottles, much like this, maybe not made of plastic. And people usually only use a few drops at a time, but... Mary didn't use just a few drops when she anointed Jesus' feet. She had a large container, and she used all of it. The scripture says the whole room was filled with a scent. Mary was generous to show her love for Jesus. She wanted to give Jesus all she had to honor him. Now, since Jesus is not here on earth anymore... We show our love for him when we are generous in giving what we have to care for others. Right, Sam? Uh-huh. Do you help others? Do you like to help others? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's have our prayer. Dear God, who loves us so much, thank you for sending Jesus to earth to show us your love and care. Help us to be as generous in showing our love for Jesus as Mary. Amen. Would you like to have a clip, clipboard? Where are they? Behind me. There we go. <laughs> there you go. You want to have one more smell of the lavender? Yeah. <laughs> it should have been. I neglected to have the printout up here. I apologize to John ahead of time. He's got it with him in the back. It's been one of those mornings, I tell you. But we are still worshiping. Isaiah 43, 19. Look, I'm doing new things. Now it sprouts up. Don't you recognize it? I am making a way in the desert, pass in the wilderness. Now we'll go to John 12, 1 through 8. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, 
home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus, Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one uh, among those who joined him at the table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount of almost three quarters of a pound of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one that was about to betray him, complained, this perfume was worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money, he carried the money bag and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. This perfume was used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. This is the word of our Lord. Did you notice that today's passage from the Gospel of John begins and ends with Lazarus? You may recall Lazarus as the one who Jesus has raised from the dead, but the focus today is on his sister, Mary. Scripture paints a picture of Jesus having a very close and loving relationship with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. And we have three different stories preserved in Scripture that involve them interacting with Jesus. In the first, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, Jesus is at the home, at their home in Bethany, which is just a few miles um, outside of Jerusalem. Mary is in the kitchen, excuse me, Martha is in the kitchen preparing the meal that is to come while Jesus is teaching. Mary, however, is sitting among the disciples at Jesus' feet, listening, eagerly soaking it all in. And Jesus affirms her choice. This singling out of Mary of Bethany as one who chose to ignore societal conventions of the day that would have put her in the kitchen as well, has given her the nickname of Mary the Intellectual by at least one commentator. Then in the Gospel of John chapter 11, Lazarus is very ill and his sisters send for Jesus. Verse 5 of that chapter explicitly says that Jesus loves these three siblings, yet he does not rush when he hears that Lazarus is ill, knowing that he has the power to heal Lazarus. And sure enough, before Jesus arrives, Lazarus has indeed died. He has been dead and laying in a tomb for four days. Martha runs out to greet Jesus, and in the course of conversation, she declares to him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And Jesus affirms her declaration as he brings Lazarus back to life. And now we have today's telling of the anointing of Jesus by Mary of Bethany. Similar stories are also found in Mark 14 and Matthew 26, but there are definite differences. The woman is unnamed in both of those two Gospels, as is so often the case. But here in the Gospel of John, Mary, sister of Lazarus and Martha, is specifically named. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Jesus is in Bethany, But he's at the home of Simon, whom Jesus had previously healed from the skin disease of leprosy, instead of at Lazarus' home, as we have in today's reading from the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew, the unnamed woman anoints Jesus' head, whereas Mary of Bethany anoints his feet. Rachel Held Evans writes that in the ancient Near East, the act of anointing signified selection for some special role or task. Kings were often anointed on their heads with oil 
as part of their coronation ceremony, often by a prophet or a priest. The Greek word Christos, Christ, is a translation of the Hebrew word for Messiah, which means the anointed one. And so the unnamed woman of Mark and Matthew find herself surprisingly in the position of priest and prophet. But in the upside down kingdom of Jesus, it makes perfect sense. Yet Mary's story is different. We know from previous encounters that she and her siblings have an intimate relationship with Jesus as some of his closest and dearest friends. A good way of thinking of them is that they were like family. I think many of us uh, have those folks in our lives with whom we are so close and we feel such a depth of love that uh, we say in describing them that they are like family to us even when there is no genetic or marital connection. And we can understand the strength and intimacy of that kind of relationship. As Evans points out, anointing the feet is different from anointing his head. This anointing models service, discipleship, and extravagant love. In this sense, John's account is more personal. In a culture in which a woman's touch was often forbidden, Mary dares to cradle the feet of Jesus in her hands and anoints them. Rather than measuring out a small amount of oil, Mary pours it all out. She's all in, fully committed, sparing no expense. The oil has been poured out generously without any thought to the future. The humility of this action foreshadows the foot washing that is to come on Monday, Thursday, when Jesus will model for his disciples what he wants of them after he is gone. We know that suffering and death await him. And it seems that perhaps Mary of Bethany also knew that his earthly time was soon to end. The others in the room at the time do not seem to understand, but here we see a clear foreshadowing of the death that is soon to come. In the Gospel of John, this anointing comes soon after Jesus had raised Lazarus back to life. And the author tells us it is just six days before the Passover. We know that Jesus will celebrate his last Passover with his disciples at what we commonly call his Last Supper. We know that the raising of Lazarus has gained Jesus a lot more followers, and word of his miracle is rapidly spreading. And the author tells us that now the religious leaders not only want Jesus dead, but they want Lazarus killed as well to put an end to this uprising. In the midst of all this symbolism and foreshadowing, we are also reminded of the precious oils, frankincense, and myrrh, which the Magi presented to toddler Jesus and his mother Mary to recognize and honor him as the child king. Oils that could also have been used to prepare a body for burial. So we see this thread of connection between this Mary's action, excuse me, from his, so we see this thread of connection from his childhood through to his death that is still yet to come in this story of anointing. And we also see a contrast between this Mary's actions and those of Judas. Judas, one of the inner 12 who traveled with Jesus for three years and who was entrusted to be the keeper of the purse. Judas counters Mary's extravagant generosity with complaint, feigning concern for the poor for whom it might have been sold to serve. When Jesus points out that you will always have the poor with you, he is telling Judas, there is still time for you to care for the poor. I have little time left. 
But how often present day folks who purport to be followers of Jesus pull this line, you will always have the poor with you, out of context, as if Jesus was telling his followers not to worry about taking care of the poor, as if it is destiny that we must always have poor people who do not have enough to fulfill their needs. It is quite a leap to take when everything about Jesus' life flies in the face of such an interpretation. Rather, those who are closest to Jesus will cultivate a desire to really know Jesus' teachings, as Mary of Bethany did, as well as to live out extravagant generosity as a way of showing their love for Jesus. It won't be with costly perfume, but it will cost us something. We have choices to make with our resources, Reverend Dr. Rachel Keefe says. And she asks, how often do we choose to pour out our very best on Jesus? Are we willing to give to Jesus that which is most valuable? What extravagant love have we offered Jesus just because Jesus is Jesus? Reverend Sharon Blessard says that Mary somehow grasps the true meaning of costly grace and lavish love. She puts all that she has into her worship of Jesus on this night, even drying his feet with her hair. In that day and age, this was a scandalous interaction between a woman and a man who was not her husband. She becomes completely vulnerable in a sense, declaring her complete dependence on and allegiance to this prophet of an upside-down, inside-out way of being. She was all in for whatever was to come. Can you smell that sweet scent of devotion, of a life broken open and poured out for Jesus? Can you calculate the cost of the grace and the love and the mercy in denarii or dollars, drops of precious oil or drops of blood poured out for you and for me, for this entire beautiful, broken world? Yes, a life poured out in service and in worship of Christ is a costly one, but so is the grace that sets us free to live. Go ahead, break yourself open and destroy the illusions that keep you confined and that cloud your vision. Pour yourself out in praise, prayer, and purpose. Live your one precious life in a way that leaves nothing held back. Dr. Keefe agrees. She says, when it comes to transformation, it might just require this extravagant outpouring from us. I think about my own experience, she says. Over time, I was able to let go and ask God to put something new in place. The letting go was scary. Offering God everything I had, nothing withheld. Can you smell the nard, the extravagance filling the room? Keith goes on to say, church, it's time we seek to anoint Jesus with that which we hold most dear. We need to break those jars and let the smell of extravagant love flood the room while the tears of grief fall. Cultivating trust in God is a gift worth cultivating. God is always doing something new. It's time for us to let go of the same old thing and cultivate extravagant love instead. It is worth the risk. Amen.
to our Lord's table. Would you like to stand as you will and join us in singing hymn number 386, We Come as Guests. Amen. Let us sing. <clears throat> We are an imperfect people, 
We may forget something we were supposed to do for worship. We may lose our place in the sermon. We may lose track of our music. But it's okay because we are human, and we don't have to be perfect. We worship a perfect God who came and made God's self known to us in the life of the human man, Jesus. And as we draw closer to the cross, communion takes on uh, added meaning, I think. As we know, uh, we are coming to that time when he suffered great agony, but he was not deterred from his mission, despite those who wanted to kill him. And it was on that night when he gathered with his closest disciples and he took the bread and after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is a symbol of my body given for you. When you eat of it, remember me. And in like manner, after the meal, he took that common cup and he said, this is a sign of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. When you drink of it. Remember me. And so it is that disciples through the years since have sought to remember the life, the teachings, the death, and most of all, the resurrection of Christ. As we observe the meat through these elements or whatever we use to represent them. And it is a table that is open to all. No one is perfect. No one can meet some imaginary standard to be able to come to this table. And they don't have to, because it is Christ who invites us all. Let us pray. Lord, we come today grateful for your love, thanking you for your blessings that sometimes in our rush of daily living we forget to take the time to appreciate. We look at your world and see your love in the beauty of a sunrise or sunset, the gentle breeze on a hot summer day, the rainbow after the storm, the promise of your everlasting love. We thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift of all, your son who died so that we might have eternal life. As we gather at this table today in remembrance of that last supper, we give thanks as we celebrate this season of Lent, as we celebrate you and your son. We come together and pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take, eat, drink, and remember. It is our custom to not only observe communion each Sunday, but to also remember a time of offering. And even though we don't 
pass plates anymore. We do offer them at the back of the sanctuary, and you can also send your gifts via mail or through the Givelify app online. But we know that financial gifts are not the only gifts that we offer to the church and to Christ. We offer our gifts of ourself and our time and our talent. And as we continue in this journey of Lent and we continue thinking about what we're going to cultivate and what we're going to let go, may we think about that in terms of our gifts and how we show our love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are your people gathered together today in fellowship and love. We have listened to your word, praised you in word and song, and given thanks for our many blessings. Now we offer back to you a portion of what we have received. We pray that it will be used to support our church and its dedicated staff, as well as our outreach into the community and the world beyond. You alone, Lord, know what each of us give, and we pray it is acceptable and pleasing to you. We pray that some of our giving even be called lavish and extravagant for the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, as we prepare to leave this place, we can imagine hearing our Lord saying, Go, my children, with my blessing. Stand, if you'd like, and join us in singing as we close out our service. Go, my children, with my blessing.
We came to worship, and indeed we did. And as we leave this time of worship, may you go with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit to carry you through this next week. Go in peace. Hey, Beth.